virus that causes COVID-19 is a systemic virus that can attack nearly every organ system. We found SARS-CoV-2 in the brain, we found it in the lungs, we found it in the kidneys, we found it in the heart, we found it in the intestines. So it's really not only a respiratory virus that, that affects you know, the lungs, it affects nearly every organ system. We also know that SARS-CoV-2 can also attach itself onto endothelial cells. So what are endothelial cells? Endothelial cells are the lining of blood vessels. You have blood vessels all over your body. And what lines those blood vessels are endothelial cells. SARS-CoV-2 attaches itself to these endothelial cells, causing inflammation in those cells. Subsequently, that may lead to small clots or large clots in those blood vessels, blocking blood flow and causing disease. Of particular concern, actually, what we always really are concerned about is the ability of SARS-CoV-2 to actually attack or, or provoke inflammation in the brain. That actually may explain why some people have brain fog. What it really does in the brain is that it, sort of a, it, it causes inflammation in uh, microglial cells. These are the small cells, the small immune cells that are supposed to protect the brain from, from infections and, 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 and other um, offending agents. So those cells provoke an inflammation in the brain, leading to subsequently diseases in the brain, including brain fog, but not only brain fog, could potentially have strokes or, or other, other manifestations. So how does COVID stack up against the flu? What we know is that COVID infects more people than, uh, we have more people with COVID than people with the flu. COVID leads to more hospitalization than the flu. COVID leads to more death than the flu. And COVID leads to long COVID, a disease, a disabling disease that we have no treatment for. So it's really not a, not a trivial virus and trivializing COVID is, is, is really uh, is, is, is not consistent with reality. My initial COVID infection was the end of August, start of September 2021. Um, it was just going back when schools had started again and during the initial infection I wasn't too bad. Symptoms started to develop after the isolation period when I was trying to go back to school. I was fainting and the muscle pain started and it was then that we sort of realised that something wasn't right and I, ha I wasn't getting better, I was getting worse after the infection. I think I believed what we were told about the risks to children and the risk of children spreading COVID. It almost feels a bit, you feel a bit stupid afterwards because it, it clearly doesn't make any sense, you know, because we, we hear about, and we talk about childhood diseases and chicken pox and measles and all these things that you know that children get and spread at school or whatever. Um, and yet, despite knowing that, I, I sort of, I don't know, I was willing to believe that the kids would be okay. Maybe it was a, maybe it was like a, an emotional defense mechanism or something. Some days Rosie would be okay, and other days maybe I would be on a video call with work in the kitchen, and Rosie would come down and she'd be like, Dad, I fainted again. Or she was holding her arm, she'd bruised herself, collapsing in the shower. And to start with, I guess, we tried to believe it was just maybe tiredness from the infection, it hadn't gone away properly. And um, so it took a little while to, to sink in that there was something more seriously wrong than that, but we didn't know what, and we didn't understand it. Before Rosie got ill, I think I associated long COVID with people who were very ill during the acute phase, perhaps had been hospitalized or been very severely unwell and then weren't recovering or were developing other problems, maybe lung problems afterwards. Um, but I didn't really understand that it was possible to be really not ill at all or, or not noticeably very ill during the acute phase and yet still um, develop a condition which, well, three years in hasn't gone away yet um, and doesn't really show any signs of doing so. So long COVID is a term that, that describes the long-term health effects of SARS-CoV-2 infection, and that includes more than 200 symptoms in various organ systems. Long COVID can affect everyone across the age span. We, we have people who have kids with long COVID, and we have people who are 100 years old with long COVID. 
And long COVID can affect people regardless, regardless of the severity of initial infection. Actually, as a matter of fact, most people, most people in the world who have long COVID had mild disease to start with. I deal with uh, brain fog on a daily basis. Some days it's worse than others. Um, I used to be very big into reading and writing and was planning on doing English for A-level. Um, but after my COVID infection, that just wasn't possible. Um, I struggle with short-term memory loss as well. Um, my memory and concentration is quite bad. When I was trying to get back into school, I had a couple of months where I was maybe in for a couple of hours um, for a lesson every couple of weeks and we had meetings with the school to try and figure out a way where I could have my education but that didn't end up being possible and I did have to leave the grammar school I was attending. The majority of people we see in the clinic were previously healthy individuals, previously healthy, did not have any medical problems at all, and then subsequently developed long COVID. So long COVID can affect people across the lifespan, across age, race, ethnicity, and baseline health status. Why do people not believe uh, you know, patients with long COVID? I can't, because the disease ha does not really have outward manifestations. The disease is not really immediately visible. Uh, and, and many, many people with long COVID actually with, with, withdraw from, from the social circles and become invisible in society. You look fine when really you're not. It's just sort of a mask and people can't see the symptoms. Um, and, or people would see you out of the house and then you'd see them another time and they'd be, oh, you've been out of the house, so you must be feeling better. When in reality, there have been days of pacing leading up to you being able to go out. And then days afterwards where you've been in bed struggling with symptoms because you actually went out of the house. You, you can't understand some of the most difficult parts of it. Um, I guess as a parent, understanding post-exertional malaise or post-exertional symptom exacerbation, as it's also known where when Rosie does some activity for a, a few hours, then to see the deterioration that comes after that, maybe two days after, in some cases, when she's really put herself into something, she would spend maybe four, five, six days unable to open the curtains, needing darkness and with headphones on to get white noise, to cancel out any uh, stimulation from, from outside. Society tend to sort of gaslight or not believe patients with long COVID because we don't really fully, fully understand it yet. And we tend to psychologize or dismiss as a society, uh, especially in the medical, medical specialties, we tend to dismiss things that we don't really fully understand. My main sort of experience with gaslighting was my GP referred me to the long COVID clinic and then I was told that I wasn't able, they weren't able to provide me support because I wasn't over 18. Well, I watched Rosie when she was told by, uh, it was an occupational therapist actually over a, over a Zoom interview that she needed to be uh, getting up and walking every day and trying to build up more exercise and so on. Um, and I just looked at, the way Rosie looked kind of crestfallen because you could see that she knew that she couldn't do that. And I had three um, assessments over Zoom call, which were essentially mental health assessments. And then after that, I was discharged because they couldn't help me um, in any other way. So that was like the main experience I had that was with gaslighting. Um, I've had quite a few doctors tell me to do yoga, um, which is, seems to be quite a common thing that people are told with long COVID. There was an appointment that we went to as well. I, I think it was a respiratory appointment and the doctor started to go down the route of telling her she was deconditioned, but it was only a few months into her illness a few months ago, Rosie was a competitive Irish dancer. She's not become so deconditioned that her muscles are wasting away at this stage, surely. 
We see people with long COVID who are totally bedridden, you know, bedbound, you know, they've, they've lost their jobs, they've lost actually friendships, they've lost some of them, they've lost marriages. So long COVID can be, can be mild in some individuals, but with long COVID can be severely disabling. Because it's so, so debilitating, it changes people's lives, it changes people's character. They describe to us in the clinic a loss of sense of you know, self. They, they, they lost their sense of self. And, and that's really, it's really very, very impactful when you, you hear patients talk about this. Like, I'm not me, I'm not me, I don't feel like me. You know, I'm not, I'm not able to do what I used to do. I'm not able to go to the same party that I used to be able to do. I'm not able to socialize with my friends. They, release their, they lose their sense of self. And that has a devastating emotional impact and, and impact on their psychological well-being. Our families had to to adapt to Rose's illness. But what we can do now as a family is much more limited. Previously we would have been out swimming, walking, hiking, doing those kind of things. And now the Rosie can't do all of that. And she'll have to prepare herself for an activity. So if there's something she really wants to do, we allow her recovery time afterwards, then she can do that. And it's worth it to see the smile um, and to feel the, the joy she experiences and, and the liberation. I've been dealing with long COVID for three years now and I think I've definitely improved a lot in terms of managing it. Um, I know what I can do and what I can't do now. It sort of crushes you a wee bit when you're able to do something and then afterwards you have to deal with feeling dreadful. Um, In some individuals, and very, very rarely, it actually can get better. Symptoms get better with, you know, within a few weeks or a few months, and they completely recover. But that's really a minority, a minority of patients with long COVID. Most people with long COVID do not experience full recovery at all. Most people with long COVID experience either a partial recovery or have continued disease. And in some individuals, also long COVID continues to get worse with time. Um, especially if they got exposed to repeated infections. They experience flares with repeated infection and, and they may, they may uh, actually get worse with time. She still suffers and she still struggles when a group of her friends are going out and she'll maybe push on, stay out longer than she knows she should because she's enjoying herself or she wants to, she wants to be part of the crowd. And then she comes home and she crashes and uh, there was an instance not that long ago where she was just sobbing and sobbing in my arms. Um, Dad, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I wish I was normal. And what do you do with that as a parent? It's a big mix of a lot of different emotions um, and struggling with missing all the things that you used to be able to do and you're not able to do it anymore. Um, and trying to come to, ter to terms with that. The real breakthrough moment, I think, with, with uh, making progress on Rose's illness was when we saw uh, a consultant um, who uh, sadly is, has retired now. But he was a brilliant man and very caring. And uh, at the first appointment Rosie saw him, um, basically the first thing he said to her was, was Rosie, you must never let anyone tell you that what you're experiencing isn't real um, and of all the things any doctor ever said to her that was the one thing that really made a difference because she knew that he believed her um, and that even though maybe he couldn't fix anything that he was going to try. It's so easy when you look at me when I'm out and I've done my makeup and I've dressed up and I've washed my hair to think, oh, that I'm actually okay, but it is a real thing and people do actually struggle and there's a lot of other people who struggle with the same thing. Whatever you do, avoid getting COVID because the only way you can avoid this miserable existence is by keeping clear of that infection. Um, there's no other guaranteed way. It's awful watching your child suffer and not being able to help. 
we're not learning the lessons from this pandemic, that we're not learning that more and more people will continue to get infected, more and more people will continue to get long COVID. The immunity against SARS-CoV-2 wanes with time. They can actually still get infected again and again. You know, to the level that people talk about this complete immunity, no. I mean, the, the idea that, that uh, you know, we're all going to be you know, completely immune against COVID-19 is, is really is, is, is fiction. It would be nice if it was true, but it's, it's delusion.